<clears throat> Welcome, everyone. Um, we are going to get started. Thank you for being here today. Um, I'm Martha Meacham. I'm the project director for the Network of the National Library of Medicine, and I just want to thank you all for being here. This has been a great partnership between a number of different groups, and I'm proud and excited for this presentation. Uh, but first, a few housekeeping notes. Please keep yourself muted and use the chat function for any questions or comments. Um, we are recording and we'll be sharing all the information presented today afterwards, including the recordings and the presentations. There will be an evaluation at the end of the presentation today. Um, please help us by filling out that evaluation. Um, it helps us improve our programming and learn what we can do in the future. And finally, there is live closed captioning today, so please take advantage of that. Um, briefly, I wanted to introduce the network of the National Library of Medicine, also known as NNLM. We could go to the next slide. As the name suggests, the NNLM is part of the National Library of Medicine, which is within the National Institutes of Health. We are the education and outreach arm of the National Library of Medicine. We work regionally, getting to know communities and helping those communities best serve people. But we are present across the entire country to advance the health and well-being of everyone through access and understanding of how to use health information. This includes working with organizations like libraries of all types, schools, healthcare, and all sorts of community-based organizations. We do this primarily through three different methods, um, providing funding to organizations that can then work within their own communities that they know best, we do many other forms of outreach and engagement. And then like today, we offer a wide range of training and education opportunities. So I encourage everyone to please visit nnlm.gov to learn more. And now I'm happy to uh, introduce Bob McNellis, Senior, Advisory for Disease, uh, Senior Advisor for Disease Prevention within the National Institutes of Health Office of Disease Prevention. Over to you, Bob. Thank you, Martha. I uh, really appreciate it. It's great to see you again. So been so much fun to work with you on this. Uh, and welcome to all of you. Uh, happy Health Literacy Month. Uh, I want to offer uh, greetings on behalf of the Office of Disease Prevention at the National Institutes of Health. We want to thank all of you for attending today's webinar. The title of today's session is Partners in Public Health, Healthy People 2030, and the Role of Public Libraries in Promoting Health and Health Equity. This is part two of our two-part series. Last week, we heard from Rear Admiral Paul Reed, Dr. Irma Arespi, and Dr. Sasha Fleary, and had a terrific discussion. It was fantastic. Um, and it was a great prelude to today's session. As part of this, I want to make sure we thank all of our colleagues, all of you at the National Library of Medicine, Martha and your team, thank you. Those of you at the Office of Disease Prevention and Health Promotion and the Department of Health and Human Services, who you'll hear from shortly, the National Center for Health Statistics, my colleagues at the NIH Institute of uh, Office of Disease Prevention, and of course, today's speakers, Katie, Erica, and Monique, for helping us put together this exciting event today. I now have the honor of introducing our first two speakers. First up is Carter Blakey. Ms. Blakey is the Deputy Director of the HHS Office of Disease Prevention and Health Promotion and Director of the Community Strategies Division. She'll provide an overview of Healthy People 2030. Now in its fifth iteration, Healthy People provides science-based 10-year national objectives for improving the health of people nationwide. On a personal note, Carter's been the face of Healthy People for me for the past 10 years that I've been involved with it. Thanks to you and your team, Carter, for the amazing work you do on Healthy People. After Carter, we'll hear from Commander David Wong. He's the Branch Chief for Health Promotion Statistics in the Division of Analysis and Epidemiology at CDC's National Center for Health Statistics. Commander Wong will share more about the data collected to measure progress toward meeting healthy people objectives, and will provide a really cool demonstration of some of the available resources. I've known David for many years as well, and similar to Carter, he's been the face of NCHS's support of healthy people for me, and instrumental in creating um, so many of the wonderful resources that we're going to see today. So kudos to you, David, and, and your whole team. So with that as introduction, Carter, the virtual podium is yours. <laughs> Great. Thanks a lot, Bob. And I'll echo all of your um, thanks to everyone on the, on the line today and all of our colleagues at NIH, who for years we have um, been working with. And ODP at NIH, Office of D Disease Prevention, has been 
um, a funder of our efforts, and they really help us amplify um, and help NIH align with what we're doing. So huge thanks to everyone. So we can go to the next slide. So I'll give a, a little bit of context for where Healthy People um, falls within the Department of Health and Human Services and at HHL. So within um, the Office of Disease Prevention and Health Promotion, we have several key responsibilities that we carry out on behalf of the nation, actually. So Healthy People, of course, is the cornerstone to everything we do um, in ODPHP. We also are responsible for providing um, reliable health information to the public, and we do that through our website, health.gov, and our um, tool, My Health Finder, that helps um, people find the preventive services that they need. We're also the department's lead, along with um, the Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality on health literacy, which, of course, if we don't have a health literate, literate nation, um, how are we going to get them healthy? And then um, a couple of other major responsibilities we have are the dietary guidelines for Americans, which we all follow, I and mean, inform those nutri nutrition facts labels that we see on everything we eat. And we also are responsible for developing and issuing the physical activity guidelines for Americans. So next slide, please. So Healthy People has been around for um, a long, long time. It, we like to say it's the longest running disease prevention health promotion program in the country and even uh, across the world. Other countries have been using it for decades. So next slide, please. So Healthy People, um, our first iteration was released in 1980. That was the first iteration of the national objectives. And the year before that, the Surgeon General had released his landmark report on um, disease prevention health promotion, which informed those national objectives. So as Bob said, Healthy People provides um, national level um, data-driven science-based objectives that we set 10-year targets for. So we not only um, have these objectives, but we hold ourselves accountable by setting those targets. Um, we also are used to inform or used by others to inform their own disease prevention and health promotion planning efforts. Um, many states and local health departments have modeled their efforts after what we do, as well as to um, non-governmental organizations. Um, academic communities have used healthy people as a teaching tool, and even other countries have um, developed their own um, healthy people versions, whether, whether it's Healthy Korea 2020, et cetera. And while healthy people is led and managed at the federal level, it really is data uh, stakeholder driven. Um, we rely on input from um, entities across the, the country, inside and outside of the federal government to inform what we do. And we do that you know, through public comment periods, public meetings, um, et cetera. So next slide, please. So Healthy People 2030, as Bob said, is the fifth iteration of the initiative. And while Healthy People has evolved over the, its decades of life, it really has remained dedicated to addressing the social determinants of health, um, and improving, improving the, the, na the nation's health and well-being efforts by advancing health equity. And this slide shows you what we call our framework. It's our vision, mission, and overarching goals. And one thing to note about this decade's iteration is that the concept of well-being has been integrated through each element of this framework. So you can look at our overarching goals. and. Uh, while we've always focused on achieving um, health equity, eliminating disparities, and now we want to attain health literacy, um, we've integrated um, well-being into um, each of those overarching goals. And we, of course, continue to emphasize the importance of the social determinants of health, and we've expanded that a little bit to include um, explicitly, explicitly economic environments. And what we've added um, this decade as a fifth overarching goal is explicit and articulated 
um, recognition that we can't do this alone and we need to look to um, key constituents across multiple sectors inside and outside of the federal government to get this work done. So next slide, please. So Healthy People 2030 is comprised of several different elements. You know, I mentioned the framework, um, which kind of provides our overarching vision for the plan. We also have our over, overall health and well-being measures. And those are kind of broad health status measures that we don't set targets for. And one thing exciting about this decade is that we've added a measurement of well-being to those overarching, um, over, overall health and well-being measures. And we're working closely with the National Center for Health Statistics to get data for that new measure. And then, of course, central to healthy people are its objectives. This decade, we have three different types of objectives. We have what we call our core objectives, and those are objectives that we have um, data for, and we've been able to establish those 10-year targets. And we will track um, publicly progress toward meeting those targets on health.gov, our website. We also have developmental objectives. Those are objectives that, just like the core objectives, represent um, important and critical um, national health priorities, but we just don't have a reliable, valid data source to allow us to have a baseline um, data and set that 10-year target and then track progress across the decade. And um, for Healthy People 2030, we have included a, a third type of objective, which is new. It's called a research objective. And those are objectives that address um, important public health issues. We may have a data to track whatever that issue could be, but we just don't have the evidence base to show that if we focus on whatever the issue is, we'll see improvements in health status. So next slide, please. And then um, key to our different elements are the leading health indicators, which I forgot to mention, we're in uh, the green box within the core objective um, box on the last slide. But the leading health indicators are a smaller subset of the overall set of Healthy People 2030 objectives that represent um, the most critical uh, objectives, issues, that if people were to align with those um, specific measures, we could see substantial um, improvements in health. And for this decade, we have 23 of those ob objectives. And while every objective in healthy people is important, we've heard across the decades that um, some people would like us to make it easier for them to decide what to focus on if they don't want to comb through all 358 objectives that we have that are measurable right now. So um, these do address health across the life stages. And we also, when selecting these leading health indicators, we did it with an eye toward equity and also an eye toward the social determinants of health. Um, next slide, please. Uh, as I mentioned, social determinants of health remained um, kind of elevated, highlighted, emphasized in Healthy People 2030. Um, they have been a part of Healthy People's healthy people since its inception. Well, perhaps we haven't had specific objectives since the beginning that addressed um, SDOH. We have recognized the importance of factors outside of the typical health realm that influence our health status. So healthy people 20, oops, can you go back please? Healthy people 2030 defines the social determinants of health as conditions in the environments with, where people are born, live, work, play, worship, and age that affect a wide range of health, functioning, and quality of life outcomes and, and risks. So the um, SDOH have a major impact on health, well-being, and quality of life. And some examples from Healthy People 2030 are you know, safe housing, transportation, neighborhoods, um, racism, discrimination, and violence, education, job opportunities, um, access to nutritious foods, um, physical activity opportunities, um, environmental factors like polluted air, 
uh, water, and of course, language and literacy skills. So we have um, five domains within our framework for SDOH, and those you can see on our slides. So hopefully that can make folks easy, make it easy for folks to pick up um, our framework. Um, so next slide, please. So there are many ways that organizations and individuals can use healthy people to improve the health and well-being of their communities and their specific populations. Um, and there are just a few organizations, few examples of how organizations can use healthy people in their work shown in this slide. Um, healthy people's used um, to align other, other programmatic efforts, um, whether it's health improvement strategies um, that may include the broader societal factors that contribute to public health issues like transportation and economic development. Um, organizations reference healthy people objectives and data. You know, for example, by using the objectives as a menu uh, for options um, to choose from that they should focus on in developing their own plans. Um, healthy people target setting methods and tools can be applied to local data trends as well. I think David will talk, touch on that a little bit. And then organizations use healthy people to compare local data to healthy people data. For example, indicators, indicators based information system for public health um, is a dashboard that allows states to track and compare um, their progress to the healthy people objectives. So next slide, please. So there are many tools and resources available on the Healthy People 2030 website. And uh, the new features are anticipated to be added throughout the decade. So we have the free user-centered information, tools, and resources available um, for you to consider. We have you know, reliable national data for disease prevention and health promotion objectives. Um, and that population data is very important because you can use that to identify um, health disparities across different population groups for different issues. Um, we have now data charting features. So you don't have to look at a, a big table of data. Instead, you can see it displayed via an easy to read data chart. And we offer evidence-based resources um, that identify rigorous science-based interventions that have demonstrated positive outcomes. And we have our social determinants of health literature summaries that look at several of the SDOH um, areas that I had mentioned previously. And really, we've done the, the hard work of all the literature search, and we summarize that all for you uh, right there on our website. We also have a tool called Healthy People in Action that um, provides evidence-based examples of how healthy people is being used in the field by others. And we also, for this decade, have a quarterly webinar series where we're, prevent, where we're presenting the progress data for specific objectives. So next slide, please. So here, um, as I mentioned, we have our Healthy People in Action webpage that includes you know, blog posts that feature partnership stories, um, community stories, news and events, and they highlight how organizations and communities are partnering to improve health, reduce disparities, and achieve health equity. So the partnership stories highlight the work of Healthy People's official partners, and those are our champions. And these stories show um, how partners are working across sectors to achieve health equity and the Healthy People vision. The community stories demonstrate how communities across the nation are working to address specific Healthy People 2030 topics and, uh, and objectives. And to improve health, these communities um, use the evidence-based strategies or rigorous evaluation of promising practices. Um, then, of course, we have the news and events posts that feature information about Healthy People 2030 webinars, events, and announcements. So, um, you can easily sign up to be on the list to receive those announcements by going to our website. So next slide, please. 
So with Healthy People 2030, we've launched um, what we're calling our Champions Program. And this is, if any of you have been uh, working with us on healthy people for uh, past decades, you might recognize this as being similar to our Healthy People Consortium. We've got to revamp the whole concept of what it means to um, support healthy people. And this is our Champions Program. So Healthy People Champions represent a diverse array of public and private organizations that impact health outcomes at the state, tribal, and local levels, um, private and public sector. We even have businesses um, and philanthropic organizations who are um, Healthy People Champions. Um, this, these organizations are committed to working toward healthy people's overarching goals and objectives in their communities and service areas. Um, and we recognize um, Healthy People Champions on our Healthy People website. We provide a digital badge that our champion organizations can use to highlight um, their support of Healthy People 2030 on their own websites. And we also invite our champions to participate in our champions learning collaboratives, where it provides small group, um, sometimes one-on-one um, -on -one interaction with the staff at ODPHP and the National Center for Statistics. So um, please click on some links. I don't know if someone's going to post the, the link to the champion program, but um, feel free to explore our website and learn more about that. So you can go to the next slide. So with that, um, I thank you all for um, being with us. Um, there's information on how to catch up with all we're doing on our website and our Twitter handle. And with that, I believe, David, I'm going to hand the webinar over to you. And while David uh, gets ready to share his screen, I just have a quick programming note that we're likely going to um, skip the interim Q&A for the healthy people portion and try to answer all the questions at the end um, in our main Q&A discussion at the end. So feel free to utilize the chat, though, in the interim. And David, back to you. Great. Uh, thank you so much. And if I could just get a confirmation, you can hear me and see my slides. That would be great. Perfect. Yes. Yep. OK. All right, well, thank you, everyone. Thank you for the opportunity to be here and present the data side of healthy people. Uh, my name is David Huang, as Bob McNellis mentioned, and I will be um, building on some of the data content that my colleague Irma Arispe presented um, to you, all of you in part one last week and diving a little bit more into the topics of targets and disparities. So first of all, just a little bit about targets. Um, many of you uh, are familiar with um, federal health indicator projects, but even if you're not, um, the inclusion of quantifiable targets is something that certainly sets healthy people apart from other kind of broad federal health initiatives. Um, in a way, they do set policy expectations as they can be seen as a benchmark for what is to come over the next 10 years. And they do offer a marker for assessing progress over the decades, both for individual objectives and for the initiative as a whole. The current iteration, Healthy People 2030, um, aims for greater transparency and a more systematic approach. So as part of that, we have established some methods as well as six specific target setting methods, which you can see listed here, which um, we have applied to all core objectives, that is objectives with data over the current decade. Certainly there um, is more um, technical uh, content that you can um, feel free to explore at your leisure at the um, um, publication that's shown at the bottom of this slide. And I'm sorry, it's at the bottom of this slide. Um, and uh, just to note that the targets are set by topic area work groups. These are subject matter experts who um, are uh, the federal, mostly federal um, representatives kind of leading the charge for the objectives. Um, there is also a vetting process as all targets had to be approved by a steering committee, the federal interagency work group. And this process really ensured, as I mentioned, um, not only kind of transparency in the way that targets were set, but also 
consistency in um, the guidance that was set forth. And I'll note that NCHS in our role as statistical advisor did provide methodological guidance, and also we provided tools to help um, help the work groups um, help guide the process for the work groups um, in partnership, of course, with ODPHP. For the first time in Healthy People history, a flowchart was developed, um, and this was used to help topic area work groups um, use an explicit and consistent process to select targets. Um, and here are the target setting methods that, uh, that are used in Healthy People 2030. I'm not going to go through this flowchart in detail, but did want to um, let you all visualize it. Um, it is included in that publication that I mentioned earlier. Um, basically, there are decision points that kind of lead um, the work group or another entity that's looking to set targets um, arrive on a suggested target setting method. And then there are two tools that NCHS developed in our role as statistical advisor. You can see them um, circled in green here in uh, this blue font. Um, there's a percent improvement or minimal statistical significance tool, as well as a trend analysis tool that is um, available uh, to the public. So all of you are welcome to check those out on our website, and I will share that link um, at the end of my slides. Next, I'm just going to talk a little bit about disparities before um, providing a little bit of a demo on our website. And first of all, just wanted to give a really quick history of disparities in the Healthy People Initiative. There was um, a report that was published in 1985, the HHS report of the Secretary's Task Force on Black and Minority Health. This was also known as the Heckler Report and was released by then HHS Secretary Margaret Heckler. This report focused on healthcare access by minority groups, as well as on the six causes of death that accounted for more than 80% of mortality among racial and ethnic minorities. And these findings actually serve to mobilize um, the disparities work and infrastructure that is, um, a lot of which is still present in the department today, including, uh, most notably for this presentation, the inclusion of a disparities-related overarching goal for healthy people, um, 2000, when it was released in the year 1990. You can see the evolution of this specific goal throughout the decades, with the current goal being for 2030 to eliminate health disparities, achieve health equity, and attain health literacy to improve the health and well-being of all. So with that in mind, um, I wanted to highlight the Healthy People 2030 data template. This is a standard template used for population-based objectives. Data are shown when the data source collects the information and applicable presentation criteria are met. There's also limited ability for work groups to request customization. I'll note that um, these are the standard set of population groups for which disparities will be assessed this decade. And in addition, there are some objectives that have more of a disparities focus in and of themselves and kind of apart from this population template by focusing on a higher risk population group. So for example, we have an objective that focuses on lesbian, gay, and bisexual high school students. So I'm gonna pause here and jump to our website where I wanted to highlight some of the concepts that I discussed. Um, there are two ways that um, we would kind of recommend searching for objectives. Um, one is to go through this objectives and data page. Um, you can browse um, via some of the topics that are listed here. And then the other way is to use the search bar. I'm going to go ahead and pull up our objective on infant mortality. I'm going to use the objective number MISH2. I kind of like to think of it as the call number for the objective, as it's a unique identifying number for the objective. And you can see here the landing page for this particular objective on infant mortality. It gives you some basic information, including, um, as I'll highlight here, the target for the objective. Um, you can see for this objective, it's 5.0 per 1,000 live births. And then the target setting method, which is uh, trend projection. The next tab here is the data tab. And I know um, Irma highlighted some of this for you last week, but I did want to highlight we have the charting feature here, as well as the ability to select a demographic group 
for population-based objectives. Um, and even though our disparities tool is not yet available, I did want to just go to a specific um, view by race and ethnicity just to give you um, a flavor for what is to come. Um, what we're aiming to do with the disparities tool is really to build on the charting feature that's currently available on the website, um, certainly building on all of the population group data that are available here, and really expand on um, this content and the visualization uh, with a particular focus on disparities. So um, unfortunately, I don't have more to show you than that by way of disparities, but I'm going to move to this next tab here on data methodology and measurement. And here you can find out more information about how the objective is measured. I also wanted to highlight there's more information about the target. This includes the um, not just the target setting method, but also the details behind the method, as well as the justification as part of this process of um, uh, or this aim of wanting to be more transparent with our targets, all work groups were required to come up with a justification that, as you can see, um, is available to the general public for every objective. And that gives you a little bit a better idea of why a particular target was selected for a particular objective. I'm going to go back to my presentation and wrap up and just highlight a couple of things that we're looking to do in the coming weeks and months. Um, we're not quite out of the woods yet with Healthy People 2020. Um, we're really excited about an upcoming release of a Series 2 report that focuses on disparities among racial and ethnic groups for Healthy People 2020 objectives. That release date is set for November 14th, and you can look for that on the um, NCHS Healthy People website. And then we're in the process of kind of wrapping up the archive of the 2020 website. I think that's actually almost complete. Um, so that is a great place to look if you want to look at um, archived information on the previous decade. For 2030, as I've alluded to, there is more to come that we're excited about. We're going to be expanding some of our charting features. We have um, notably the disparities tool that we are um, going to be releasing in stages. And um, as I mentioned, it'll expand on some of the charting features that you currently see on the website, but with more disparity-focused um, graphics, as well as um, bullets and text related specifically to disparity groups for population-based objectives. Right now, our focus is on national-level data, but in the uh, future, we will also be looking to add state-level data and maps. Um, you can kind of get a sneak peek of what you might be able to expect by looking at the 2020 website, as that was something that was included last decade. And then, of course, we have many webinars and uh, publications, as well as um, outreach and dissemination efforts that we will be continuing um, as we progress through the current decade. With that, I just wanted to leave you with a couple of websites where you can find out um, even more on the data side of things. Um, I want to thank you for your time and attention, and I look forward to our conversation and any questions that you might have. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, David. I see, I did happen to see one question in the chat, but you just answered it actually on your last slide. Um, so that, that was a nice transition. We will um, pick up any additional questions for David or Carter when we do our moderated Q&A and discussion towards the end of the hour, but also uh, feel free to use the chat. That's a great way to ask your questions, and I'm sure David and Carter and Emmeline uh, will be happy to answer those for you. So now I am thrilled to have with us this afternoon three outstanding public health libraries, all three that have been recognized as uh, healthy people champions, and each are doing tremendous innovative work in their communities to improve health and well-being. So this is intended to be a lightning round session. Each library speaker will have about five minutes to share something that they're doing in their library. And then we'll come back and have a discussion with questions and comments from the audience. Um, you can also feel free to use the chat as the speakers are sharing and then um, when we're taking questions and comments. We'll go in alphabetical order. So I'm gonna start with Ms. Katie Ball of the Sacramento Public Library. We will then hear from Ms. Erica Durr of the Catawba County Library System in North Carolina. 
And then Ms. Monique Mason of the Akron Summit County Public Library will close out our panel. So Ms. Ball, if you are ready, your slides are up and I will turn the floor over to you. Okay, I am ready. Thank you so much, Liz. Uh, so my name is Katie Ball. I'm the Special Projects Associate at the Sacramento Public Library. And I'm going to share with you about a partnership that we have with Samuel Merritt University to bring nurses to the library. So next slide, please. So I wanted to just share with you a very brief um, kind of overview of the county that we are in. We're in Sacramento County in Northern California. We have over one and a half million residents in our county and our library system has 28 physical branches throughout the county and we serve rural, uh, suburban and urban areas. And we have a little over than 6% of uh, residents without health insurance and then almost 15% are over 65 years old. Next slide, please. So this partnership with Samuel Merritt University started in uh, 2019, shortly after I came on board. And it was at a time when the library was looking to really ramp up health literacy um, and the efforts that we make here at the library. So I was introduced to Alice Vestergaard, who is the RN to BSN program coordinator for SMU, Samuel Merritt University. And she was sharing that this program is um, where the nurse scholars are working working nurses, they're all registered nurses, and they're going to school to get their bachelor's in nursing, usually to advance their careers or just gain knowledge in the field of nursing. And there's a clinical service component. So it's part of their community and public health practicum where they work with a community organization to just learn about the community that they work in and offer their services. So as we were talking, we found that we had a common goal, and that was to provide patrons with health services and reliable health information. So we formed an MOU in 2019, and we got to work in the fall semester and uh, kicked off our partnership then. Next slide, please. So the way that we actually uh, work with the nurses is uh, two ways. So we can either have them in our library branches or with our mobile services unit. And we've worked with them both ways. We really had to um, adapt and think um, strategically um, when COVID hit because we lost about a year and a half of working with SMU. And then we picked up and worked with them on our um, mobile unit because we weren't doing in-person programs in our libraries. So what we do is we have the nurses offer blood pressure clinics to patrons, um, which has been really successful. We're in the middle of the semester right now, and we've been going all over the county offering blood pressure clinics in the uh, in different libraries. Um, and at these clinics, we provide information about COVID, about the flu vaccine, um, preventative uh, information about heart and brain health. Uh, we also connect patrons with local health resources, and we can always follow up with people if there's a specific need that they have. Uh, and I have many um, health books and tools, things like pill organizers and pill cutters from previous grants um, that I always just bring out with me and offer them to the community if they would find it helpful. Um, so it's been going really well, and uh, it's been really well received both in, in the libraries and in mobile. Next slide, please. But of course, that's not where it ends. We have future plans and we really wanna grow this partnership with SMU because it has been so successful thus far. So our ultimate goal is to actually have a nurse placed in each of our 28 branches. Um, so until that happens, we'll kind of work toward that ultimately. Um, but until that happens, we would like to see at least a nurse in every region. We have our system broken down into six regions throughout Sacramento County. Um, so if we could get one in each region, that would be a really great start. Uh, and we already have four nurses that we work with every semester. So we're kind of getting there, which is really exciting to see. And then um, I'm really happy to share that most likely early 2024, we are going to have an all electric 
bookmobile that will be dedicated to um, health services, bringing health services to the community. And we're going to focus on new arrival communities throughout Sacramento. Um, that's a really big population that we have here. And it'll be another really great opportunity for the nurses to be on board, offer their services, do screenings, and connect people with health resources. So we're really excited for that. Next slide, please. And then I wanted to just share kind of at a glance why this is successful for, um, for both parties, for SMU and for Sacramento Public Library. So it's great because the nurse scholars um, that are getting their uh, bachelor's in nursing receive those clinical service hours for the time that they volunteer at the library. And they get a chance to learn about the health needs that are happening in the communities that they work in. Our patrons also gain knowledge of their health status and get connected to reliable health resources by meeting with the nurses at the library. And then we get to offer a really great service to the community. So we always like to say it's a win-win-win partnership. And then ultimately, it advances health equity in Sacramento by eliminating barriers to health care. And I wanted to just share that um, when we do these uh, blood pressure clinics in the library branches, I've heard quite a few times from patrons that they kind of go, oh, I wasn't expecting this when I came in. <laughs> I wasn't expecting there to be a nurse available to me um, when I was coming in just to pick up my books. So it's a really great kind of surprise that we get to offer um, and people get to learn about their health. So that's really great. Uh, and then I just have my last slide there that has my contact information. It's got my email there. So please feel free to reach out if you have any questions. I'm always happy to continue the conversation. And thank you so much. Katie, thank you. That was awesome. That was great timing too. Um, we will turn it now to Erica out of uh, North Carolina. Erica, are you there? Yes, hi. Uh, thank you so much for having me today. Um, I am going to try to talk, I, I could talk about this subject for forever, it seems, but I'm going to be super brief. I want to talk about uh, the different partnerships that the library has formed uh, in our efforts to provide health and wellness services at the library. Um, next slide. Um, a lot of people might not have heard of Catawba County, uh, North Carolina. Um, we're a fairly uh, small county, um, mostly rural. I guess it would count as suburban. I always feel confused about what's urban and what's suburban because our biggest city has 43,000 people. So I guess that counts as urban. Um, the community here uh, has a history of textile production and furniture making. Uh, both of those industries were uh, decimated in 2000 and then 2008. Our unemployment rate back then was over 15%. It was the highest in North Carolina. And the recovery from that has been slow. Um, and so while you can see um, from some of these statistics, um, the kind of populations that we serve, um, we also have a lot of uh, adults uh, 50 and over who have never used a computer. They didn't have to use a computer for their work and had no interest in it. And so that population um, is, is a challenge to work with since we all are trying to go digital, um, but that's not gonna reach this population. Um, as you can see, we also have two library systems in our county. Um, we have a Hickory City uh, library system that has two locations, uh, and then uh, Catawba County has seven uh, brick and mortar locations. We also have a mobile pop-up library that goes around to the county uh, different spots, and then we uh, last year installed a a uh, library locker in a laundromat where we also have our uh, pop-up library visit. Um, next slide. Um, we got on track with providing health and wellness services when our director was asked to be on the board of a nonprofit called Live Well Catawba. Um, and I'll be honest, at first I thought that Live Well Catawba was part of Healthy People 2020. It's actually part of Healthy People, Healthy Carolinas, um, which is a program um, that um, a grant funded program from the Duke Endowment. So Catawba County was selected to be one of the first cohorts 
uh, in this grant program to have a collaborative nonprofit in the community to bring uh, together all the stakeholders or as many as possible um, to make changes in our community that would help improve health outcomes. So this map is from the 2019 uh, Community Health Assessment. It is the life expectancy broken down by census tract and the Duke Endowment was um, key in gathering this data and breaking it down like this at a local level for us. But you can see the, uh, where the arrows are pointing. Um, the average life expectancy is 64.6 uh, .6 in uh, one community and less than five miles away, it's 82.6. Um, so that is a really great example of uh, showing us like where we need to provide health and wellness services. And in fact, we used this map when we decided where to place our uh, library locker. Um, it is in that, um, in that circle of census tract. Next slide. Um, you can see from the previous map, those, uh, that area with the low life expectancy is also a food desert. Um, so uh, the library asked, uh, with our director being on the board, she asked staff to serve on the working groups of Live Well Catawba. And uh, so I serve on the um, Healthy Foods, Healthy Weight uh, Working Group, which became the Food Council. We merged with another group that was already in existence in our, in our county. Um, yeah, next slide. Um, so the three priorities for Catawba County are chronic disease, behavioral health, and healthy foods, healthy weight. Uh, again, these uh, priorities help us to plan and provide programs uh, and education and partnerships with other people in the community. Next slide. Um, so here's some examples of some programs, and I'll tell you real quickly about the partnerships that made these possible. Um, we've partnered with a Cooperative Extension. Um, they do gardening. We have a community garden. They do uh, consumer and family science, uh, which is, uh, has healthy eating workshops. Um, we also have a large Hmong population here, and some of our employees are Hmong. Um, and so they wanted to do a program about egg rolls, so we tried to find a way to make that healthier. And it turned out that egg rolls in an air fryer are really delicious and save you a lot of fat and calories, so that's awesome. Um, Zumba was actually our first um, real consistent uh, fitness offering. Um, during 2020, when the library closed, uh, these Zumba aficionados went on Facebook Live. They did not want to give it up. Um, when we uh, started having in-person programming again, but we couldn't do fitness indoors, they wanted to do it in the parking lot. And that's what that picture is. These folks love this class. Um, and these, you know, I have collected stories of people who never exercised, but who come to this and bring their friends. And they also now walk around the community and, um, you know, it's a true life-changing program for them. Um, and then we've done other, this uh, in the bottom left is a, a hike. Uh, we partner with the parks department for that. Um, I don't have pictures of it, but we have had, um, we used to have nurse checks, um, and that was by partnering with our hospital uh, outreach department. Um, we did that four times a year in each of our libraries, um, and they would come and offer blood pressure check, weight check, I think waist circumference, pulse. They would give uh, the patrons a little uh, sheet that would have their measurements on there. And if the nurses recommended that they should follow up with their doctor, they would have that noted on their on their form. And uh, just like Katie said, a lot of times people weren't expecting to encounter nurses at the library. We always tried to schedule them uh, to be here when a larger program was going to be ending so that people would come out of that uh, large program. There'd be a lot of people. And so the nurses could uh, really get uh, a lot of people um, to become aware of some of their health measurements. Next slide. Um, so these are um, 
uh, examples of programs that we've done. I personally love offering um, as many different fitness classes as possible. Um, my personal uh, philosophy is that the best exercise is the exercise that you actually do. And I, I understand that not everyone is going to love the same activity. And I feel that if, if we can help people try as many activities as possible until they find the one they love, then they'll keep doing it. And that is what makes it sustainable. Um, so this summer, uh, the theme was Oceans of Possibilities. So we did Oceans of Fitness Possibilities. We had seven different um, activities, um, including water aerobics. Um, okay, yes, I, I will wrap that up and um, uh, next slide and next slide. Thank you so much, Erica. That was fantastic. And I know it's five minutes. I gave you all very, very tight timeline, so I apologize for having That's to okay. do that. Um, all right. And our, our last library representative is Miss Monique Mason from Ohio. Monique? Hi, thanks for having me. I'm from Akron, Ohio, the rubber capital of the world um, and the county seat of Summit County, um, which is an industrial city in Northeast Ohio. We're about 40 minutes or so drive just south of Cleveland. Um, our library system is a main library in downtown Akron. We have 18 branches, two bookmobiles, et cetera, et cetera. We serve throughout the whole county and a very wide range of um, people live in our county, all different, you know, every, everything is there. So it's very diverse. Um, I work out of our main library. I manage a department called Business, Government, and Science. Um, we actually provide reference um, and programming and outreach for just about every nonfiction topic that's not um, art, religion, or literature. So we're doing a lot every day, but we have a staff of nine full-time professionals and four paraprofessionals who all um, provide consumer health information. And we're really excited about this 2030 Champions program so that because that vision of a, um, a society in which all people can achieve their full potential for health and well-being across the lifespan is really aligned with, with just a, a very good public library vision. Um, and we're honored to participate and in this program. We use it to define and focus our programming. Um, next slide, please. One goal of Healthy People 2030, which is very in tune with lots of public library work, is to increase the health literacy of the population. And as librarians, you know, we strive every day to increase our users' literacy from our baby story times through our children's programs, our teen programs, our adult programs. You know, libraries are all about books and reading. But health literacy is a little bit different because it encompasses more than simply being able to read. Um, but we're in a good position as public librarians to foster health literacy at every public library. And I encourage everyone to explore the concepts of health literacy and to work to integrate it into our literacy efforts. Um, there's some websites that I include at the end of my public at the end of my presentation, and um, there's lots of good stuff through NNLM and also through um, the Health and Human Services people who are putting this on. Um, next slide, please. At my library, we created a consumer health information center more than a decade ago with the purpose of um, helping users find, understand, and use health information and services. The physical space houses consumer health information, and by that I mean um, information that's intended for um, the users, potential users of medical and healthcare services, and not intended um, to be used by medical professionals. So there's an emphasis on self-care, preventive approaches, easy to read, easy to understand materials. Um, as well as community dissemination of information uh, pam and pamphlets by uh, community groups, the county public health authority, uh, hospitals, and um, health promotion groups as well. Uh, this space, um, which has about um, 1,100 or so books in it, is in addition to our regular run of Dewey 610s. And this separate shelving is a pretty important component um, because it allows us to have reliable, evidence-based medical information written for non-medical users, um, shelved separately from that less reliable um, but still popular and in-demand health guru type of information by people like Gwyneth Paltrow or Christiane Northrop or Robert Kennedy Jr. We can have the stuff that people want. We can meet that demand that the public has, but it also lets us foster a model of health, wellness, and advocacy. Um, and all the public service staff who work in my department um, and regularly field these questions are required to have a consumer health information specialist designation from the Medical Library Association. And this is fully supported by our library administration, so the getting and the maintaining of this with the coursework is taken on library time. 
And being consumer health information specialists and keeping that current is important. It makes for really way more confident staff at the service desk. The staff are the resident experts in our system on health questions, and they're regularly being made aware of uh, new resources and websites to help patrons. It's been a really positive program for us. Uh, next slide. Another Healthy People 2030 goal is to improve the health and well-being of older adults. Next slide. And we do that through a Dementia Inclusive Library Initiative. We're committed to providing a Dementia Inclusive Resources to allow for continued participation in the library and for resources for maintaining skills and interests that make an abundant life possible outside the library walls. All library staff complete Dementia Friends training through the Ohio Council of Cognitive Health. And this training raise, raises the awareness um, and increases an empathic response from staff of with users who might be living with dementia. It results in uh, more positive interactions and hopefully in increased library use. Uh, next slide. Um, we also have memory kits, which are aimed at a caregiver to check out and to use at home with a person with dementia. These are themed kits. They're packed in a few plastic tubs, and they're filled with activities to provide some meaningful and enjoyable ways to engage in life while completing familiar tasks that are going to maintain attention, uh, promote fine motor skills, uh, to help to maintain balance and communication skills and reading skills. Um, some of these kits are office life, or in the garden, working with tools, and the one on the screen there is called in the kitchen. Uh, these kits are designed to be easy on the caregiver. The circulation policies are sort of loosened with these. There's no overdue fines, and um, staff will deliver them directly to a uh, user's car. They just call ahead, say, I'm coming to pick that up, and we bring it right to their car. Next slide. And I could go on and on forever, um, but we're out of time, and I want to leave you with the links to the resources I mentioned. So thanks. Thank you, Monique. Well, wow, these have been fantastic snapshots of truly inspirational work. So thank you all. Again, I apologize for the tight time restrictions we had today. But um, I do want to ask, I have a question. Uh, anyone feel free to put your questions in the chat. So I, the one thing I want to ask was clearly these are success stories. You all have highlighted programs that have worked really well, that are really innovative. What would you say are the biggest challenges that you face in getting these or other programs off the ground? Um, we heard a bit about funding last week. I don't know if anyone wants to talk about that or other challenges. Um, but uh, Katie, maybe I'll start with you in order of how we did the presentations. Did you have any thoughts about challenges you want to share? Well, I think with uh, 28 branches um, and a mobile services unit, it's always just trying to figure out where to go um, because until we get those 28 nurses in each uh, location, um, you know, we want to make sure that we're being equitable um, with the, the resources that we do have. Um, but of course, you, you just naturally want to be able to bring it to everybody. So we're trying to kind of go at least throughout the regions um, when we can, when it, when it works, um, and when the library is available to do so. Um, but I think that's kind of the biggest challenge right now. Erica? Um, when we first started, um, I would say our challenge was um, for, was paying for um, all of the experts that we wanted to bring in to do fitness classes. Um, but that was in 2018 uh, when we started uh, fitness offerings. And uh, in, in the years since, the county has changed the library's outcomes so that we are now expected to provide health programming. And so we have um, we have now a budget for that. Um, and and so it's just kind of built into it, which makes it a whole lot easier. As I would say the challenge now is um, our in our community, we uh, have a lot of healthcare workers who come from other parts of the country. Um, and so there's a shortage of healthcare workers here. Um, I partnered with the hospital outreach group um, and the hospital's fitness center. Um, and those, those two organizations can barely staff their own um, offerings. So it's a little bit more challenging in that regard. And I'm trying to find other partners and uh, other ways of, of accomplishing the same things. Great. And Monique, we'd love to hear your thoughts on, on this too. 
I would have to say it's time. There's so many things we want to do. I, you know, every day we're like, oh, you know, this, there's just not the time to do everything that we want to do. And I bet everybody feels that same way. That makes sense. Just like there's not enough time for this discussion. I wish we had more time. We need several hours, I think. Um, but unfortunately, I'm going to have to cut it short. We really appreciate your all's participation today. Uh, Martha, I will turn it over to you to close us out. Thank you all so much. This has been a wonderful presentation, and thank you all for attending. Um, I have put the link to the evaluation in the chat. We will also um, send out something shortly. Uh, both this and the first session were recorded, and we'll make those recordings available, um, as well as the meeting information. But with that, I want to thank my co-presenters. Thanks to everyone who put this together, and thank you again for participating. Oh, I re oh, here's the shoot. I, I will put the evaluation in right now. I sent it to a single person, not to the group. All right, thank you all very much. Thanks for watching. This video was produced by the network of the National Library of Medicine. Select the circular channel icon to subscribe to our channel, or select a video thumbnail to watch another video from the channel.